Test one, two, test, test. Yeah. He can knows I can't be home. I've been walking and talking to everybody for Well, good morning. Good to see you here at Hardison Baptist Church. Good to have you with us on this Resurrection Sunday. And we should just start singing. <clears throat> well, good morning, good morning. Glad to have you with us. Take your hymn books. We'll start our Resurrection Sunday service with 310. 310, the old rugged cross. When you find your spot, if you can, stand with us as we sing. All three verses of the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross. Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain So I cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross Someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to. cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the Happy Resurrection Day. Amen. It's good to be in God's house today. Good to see all our home folk. Good to see our, our guests with us today. Just good to be here. Amen. Amen. And, and, and I love that song. Great song. But I'm glad Amen. the death on the cross isn't the end of the story. Amen. And that's what we're celebrating here today. It's just so right. good to see everybody here today. Brother Wayne Giles, how about if you'd pray for us this morning, please, brother?
Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. You may be seated. <clears throat> it's good to see each of you here today. Uh, somebody approached me before Sunday school this morning, asking, "Was I preaching a resurrection message or a Christmas message with the weather?" You know. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I tell you, it's, uh, well, it's turned out to be a pretty day, though. I see the sun glaring in through the windows. It's just good to be here. Good to see each of you here today. Uh, just a couple of things. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of announcements this morning. But I do want to mention uh, that we're, we're not going to have evening service tonight. Uh, so go spend time with your families and, and uh, fire up your grills and all that kind of stuff. What we do when we spend time with families, just have a big day with your families and look forward to seeing you back again Wednesday night. Next Sunday morning, certain Sunday night, we'll have Robert and, and Becky Hine, our missionaries to Australia, will be with us next Sunday, uh, both services. Um, I guess that's about all as far as my announcements. I don't want to bore you with a bunch of announcements or anything. You have them in the bulletin. But I do want to mention this is a very important week this week. Miss Cherry Aerosmith, even though it's Resurrection Sunday, you're not getting out of singing happy birthday to you. So we're going to sing <laughs> to happy birthday to you. I asked her a while ago, is she 43 or 44? I know you're not supposed to discuss women's age, but when you're... Uh, you can jokingly do that and get by with it. But I said, are you 43 or 44? And she said, let me think about it. How about 18? <laughs> you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna feel, might as well feel good and enjoy it, hadn't you? <laughs> but uh, anyway, let's sing happy birthday to her. And anybody else might have a birthday in here this coming week, anybody? Wow, okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Amen. I don't know how we can come. I can't follow that, so let's uh, just, never mind. Let's just keep going. 325. 325. Continuing our, our singing about uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Amen. Lord and Savior. And we'll sing all three verses of Christ Arose. <clears throat> oh, in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he rose with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Mainly they watch his bed, Jesus, my Savior, vainly they seal the dead, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his prey, Jesus my Savior. He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Christ arose. Amen. And he did arise. Praise the Lord Amen. that he is not still in a grave somewhere. He is risen. Our last congregation, well, sort of, kind of, for this morning, our last congregational uh, before the preaching, 309, 
309, when you find your spot, stand with us if you can, and we will sing about the blood of Jesus Christ, which is just so awesome in the fact that he cleanses us. And then we'll sing the song, There is a Fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood Lose all the guilty stains. The dying thief rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as see, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. When this poor list brings Lie silent in the grave. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. In a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Were you there? When they crucified my Lord, were you there? When they crucified my Lord, oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble. Tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there? When they nailed him to the tree. Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there? When they nailed him to the tree, were you there? When they laid him in the tomb, 
Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Oh, 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 sometimes I feel like shouting glory, glory, glory. Were you there when he rose up from the grave? This time we'll dismiss our little ones and our junior church workers. Praise the Lord. He's a living Savior. Uh, turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Last Sunday was, uh, I mean not last Sunday, last year. Resurrection Day fell on, I don't remember what day of the month it was, but later on, a week or so later than this week last year. And I was candidating at the time. I don't know if it was my first official candidating message I preached here. But y'all are stuck with me now. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate the kindness and love the church has shown me and my family. Uh, It's been a blessing. And, uh, we didn't anticipate our lightning strike or our frozen pipes and a lot of the other things we've endured, but we've made it. And by the way, the um, pardon our progress in the ladies' restroom, three out of four are available, and the rest will be come Wednesday. So that's all I'll go on that subject right now. But but everything they get back, got, they got a lot of work done. They had to cut out some walls, do a lot of work there. But pardon our progress, but but here we are today on a great day, the day we celebrate and we call it, some call it Easter, some that's I prefer, and I like Resurrection Sunday. And, uh, but let's read this passage. If you would, stand with me in 1 Peter, if you found your place. 1 Peter, starting at ver- in, in verse 1. I just want to read the first four verses to start with. Kind of going to use this passage and lay out some things here, but going to go over in the Gospels in a little while and, and uh, I hope uh, preach something that will help you this morning. If you're here today and you know Christ is your Savior, but maybe there's been a darkness come about and a a tough spot maybe in your life, well, he's alive. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ is your Savior and you're lost and without hope. Praise God, he's alive. Let's talk about our resurrected Savior this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, under obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according 
to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Well, I thought I'd get at least 17 amens right there. <laughs> but that's not the end of it. According to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Verse 2 mentions the blood that was sprinkled. It says, under obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe he, that when he was that bore, shed that blood as he bore our sin on Calvary, that he sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat. I believe that blood's still in, on mercy seat in heaven. And I believe when we get there, we'll see that blood of Jesus Christ on the mercy seat. Verse 3 speaks of the resurrection. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, it took the death, took the burial, but it's sealed up with the resurrection. In verse 4, we see, well, in verse 3, again, we see that lively hope that we have. It's a Hope, not a hope that we get to get there, or boy, I sure hope so, but a, a hope, a, a understanding of our peace is a, a Greek word, if that really even matters, but the, it's a sure thing, a, a blessed hope, a, a hope that we have assurance of full hope in our salvation because he's alive today. It's a lively hope. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. I just want to preach this morning. I'm going to use that as a title, Lively Hope. But let's look at a few things this morning. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning. God, I thank you for each precious soul that's here today. Lord, we do not take lightly our guests. Lord, those, uh, Lord, we have some family members and ones visiting uh, from afar. Lord, and, and God, we've got some guests that are with us for the first time today. And uh, Lord, some friends that have brought friends. God, we're thankful for that today. God, we're needy people today. And Lord, I can only speak for myself. Lord, I, I need to hear from heaven today. Lord, I need your power and your strength to help me to preach. Lord, that we'd be affected by the preaching of the word of God. Lord, I, I need your power. God, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, whatever distractions might be on the minds of myself and our people here today, God, I pray that you'd help us that we cast those distractions aside and focus intently on the preaching of the word of God. Lord, I pray that you'd make me real small and you real big today. God, we thank you for the truth of the resurrection. Now I pray that you'd help me to preach about it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today is, is, is Resurrection Day or Easter Sunday. Uh, it's a crowning day of Christianity. All that we have in Christ is so because he rose again. In other words, if he didn't, over in 1 Corinthians, it talks about that in verse chapter 15. It talks about all the things that we wouldn't have if he rose not again. Our preaching would be in vain. I, I used that text last year, uh, but, but our preaching would be in vain. We'd, we'd, we wouldn't be true representatives of a living God. And there's so many things that wouldn't be if he did not rise again. We would not have a lively hope. We'd have a dead, I hope so. But because he's alive, boy, we have a, a true lively hope. Most of the time for the past 20 years of pastoring, I've preached on Resurrection Sunday from a doctrinal viewpoint. And what I mean by that, from the teaching, from the truths surrounding the resurrection, the things we have in, in the resurrection, things we don't have in the resurrection, what resurrection really means and ties together. And, and it is so vitally important that Christians, that we understand our Bibles, that we know truth and we understand things. Uh, now, I, I have no regrets for, for that, and I, I don't apologize for that one bit because we're called to preach the Word, and the Word focuses on truth and doctrine, doesn't it? Without the truth of the Word of God, there is no hope. Without the truth, there's all kind of false and vain religion all over the place that are not based on truth. But only the truth, my friend, will set you free. 
So I want to slowly read back through this passage. Uh, there's a lot here. There is a lot of doctrine in here. Uh, now, y'all that know me and hear me regular know that I have a, it's going to be hard when I pass through doctrinal passages not to stop and comment on the truth that's being expounded on, particularly exposed in places that are misunderstood and often falsely taught. But I want to read back through it. And there's so much here. And it's all because of the resurrection. I want to focus on four words in verse 5. And those four words are through faith unto salvation. So let me go back and read. Start at verse 1. Just read through uh, down to verse 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, a called out one apostle, had a specific duty to be done. And God called him, uh, called, uh, did I say Paul there? I get Paul and Peter mixed up sometime. But, but uh, Peter, being one of the apostles, had the, the calling of God. He ended up being uh, the, the, the one that reached mainly and predominantly that God used him to speak back to the Jewish children uh, about, about their Messiah. But anyway, it says, uh, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Pontus, Galatia Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. We see the principle of grace and, and uh, peace there. There's grace unto you and peace be multiplied. We see that principle even in the Pauline writings in the Bible. We see where there has to be grace before there's peace. But up in the beginning, use the word says elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. That does not mean that God chooses some to salvation and chooses the others to suffer in hell. But he's talking about their work and their calling. When you see the subjects of sovereignty, when you see the word election and predestination, and those things are not talking about individuals being predestined that you have no choice in the matter and, and you have no choice in it. You're going to heaven, you're going to hell. It's not talking about that. There's, God has an elect group that's, that he predestined to be conformed to his image. Those that would by faith trust him, and we'll get to the faith in just a minute, that would trust in him and believe in him, become part of that elect. But the elect, the, the, that crowd is us, the born again, those that, that uh, he chose the work to be done through the elect, through the chosen, through his people that would do his work. And follow those words through the Bible when you see those words and understand that he's not talking about elect, that you got voted in to be saved, but you don't have hope. You're going to hell. It's not any foolishness like that. I mean, the foreknowledge of God, God knew who would be saved, but he had intentions that those that would trust him would be his workers that would carry out the great commission. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, well, I'm glad for his abundant mercy today, aren't you? Boy, it's, uh, I need it every day too. And it talks about, the Bible talks about his mercy is renewed uh, daily, every morning. You got a fresh set. That don't mean we need to trample on God and use it all up in the, the day before. But I don't know about you, but a lot of days, and depending on how folks are driving and a, a lot of different circumstances, things go on. Boy, sometimes I might use that mercy up. Well, I don't use it up, but sometimes I, I'm just glad for God's mercy, aren't you? So it says, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again into a lively hope. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, a lively hope. God's people ought to be lively people. We ought to be excited about our salvation. Hey, we don't, if you know Christ today, you don't have to go to hell. We're free from our sin. We're, we're set free, praise God. Hallelujah. We're not dead in our sin, dead in our trespasses without hope and just, just moping around until we die and fall off into hell and then one day cast off into the eternal lake of fire. But we're people that's, boy, we got a lot to be excited about. So we'll preach, you keep going there trying to get some amens and all that. You're right, it says lively hope. It don't say dead hope. Use that word somber this morning and understand the context and what you meant there and all that, brother. And since you're talking about a, uh, that service you attended there and been somber sometimes. But my friends, don't misunderstand and mis don't mistake somberness for deadness or deadness for somberness. The Bible speaks of lively hope. 
We ought to be people that are excited we're saved. We ought to come to the house of God and worship him excited. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, I'll go on there. I got a few amens out of you. But don't do it for me. Do it because we have a lively hope. We have him living inside us that's made it this way that he, he, he took on a body that we celebrated Christmas. and he, he was crucified 33 and a half years later. But he came forth from that tomb, from that grave, and he's alive forevermore. A lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's living, and if you know him, we're living. He says, because I live, you shall live also. Verse 4, to an in, in, inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, I know in some places where the Bible talks about inheritance and some things that we have, some things we have can be lost at the judgment seat of Christ. The child of God can lose some reward. There's some things we can lose and, and not earn some crowns that we otherwise, because of bad attitudes and bad motives and, and things like that. But our salvation is not, not an option. If you're in Christ, you're in Christ. It's an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. It says, who are kept by the power of God. It's not my power. If you think that you are doing good things and continuing in your faith, that you, may, that you may one day get to go to heaven, my friends, that's thinking is dangerously wrong. There's no uh, work that we do that has to do that. We trust Jesus Christ with our salvation and payment for our sin and believe on him. And he does the locking in, the sealing, the saving, and it's going to take us all the way to heaven. Now, in this side, we may get in trouble because of sin. It may cost us in our body and bring about chastisement according to the book of Hebrews. But let me run on. I said, I told you if I preach through doctrine, I got to stay there a little while. Because so many folks are taught so many crazy things that are not biblical. And when you get to the subjects of, of saved by works or kept by works, that is damnable heresy. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God. Praise God for his power. Through faith and the salvation. I, how did I get it? By faith. By the way, same way the Old Testament saint got it, Abraham believed God and it's counted him for righteousness. Same way the New Testament saint get it, will get it, gets it, has got it, will get it, or going to get it. Same way during the tribulation, those that have never heard the gospel before, you know how they're going to get saved during tribulation? By faith. I did say that have never heard the gospel before, if you've heard the gospel and reject Jesus Christ, you will not have a second chance after the church is caught out of here. Okay, let me move on. Verse 6, wherein we, great, we great, ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Wow. A lot to do with temptations, trials, testings in First and Second Peter. It says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And that goes back to the judgment seat of Christ there. And verse 8 says, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now ye see him not. It's by faith. It's not by sight. But praise God, there's coming a day. And we'll see him. And our faith will become, our sight will become, our faith will become sight. And all these things that we've believed and trusted all these years. Oh, we may not shout here, but we're going to shout when we see him. Matter of fact, we're going to meet him with a shout. He's going to shout, and I believe we're going to shout. Whether you want to or not now. Whom have not seen ye love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. 
it goes on, and I like to continue on, but I, I want to read that passage and see all that we have in Christ and the fullness we're saved, we kept by the power of God because of our faith, because of what he did on the bloody cross of Calvary and he put in that grave and that third and glorious day came forth. Now, I do want to mention some doctrinal truths that hinge on the resurrection. And I'll just read through these real quickly. There's the deity of Christ. He was the Son of God. He is the King of kings. He was the Messiah they were looking for that they rejected. Romans 1.3 says, Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. It's all sealed up. And solid because of the resurrection, the dead of Christ. He is the He was the coming Redeemer. He is the coming Redeemer. He, the, my Redeemer liveth, praise God. Christ our high priest. What do we do, child of God, when we miss the mark, when we sin again? Well, we, 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sin. We go boldly before the throne of grace because he's at the right hand of the Father. How did he get there? Well, he rose again, then ascended up to the right hand of the Father. Ephesians 1, 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in, heavenly place, in the heavenly places when he raised him from the dead. Well, I'm glad he raised again on the third day, aren't you? And boy, when I miss the mark, when I, uh, man, uh, somebody pulls out in front of me and, and I grit my teeth and get a little angry and I run up and bump them on the bumper. I don't really do that. I just get real close. But, but I do that and the Lord says, you know what? Boy, what if you pull in that store up there and you need to witness to him? How are you going to witness after you got mad and shook your fist at him and all that kind of stuff and all? But I can go to 1 John 1, 9. I'm not saying we ought to do that. Maybe that wasn't a good way I put that illustration in there. Not that we ought to look for opportunities to sin. No, we can just take for the boldly for the throne of grace. Hey, but I'm just saying when we do, when we uh, make decisions that aren't pleasing to our Lord and Savior, thank God uh, that he's at the right hand of the throne of God, that we can take our case before him. But you know what? Uh, he just likes to hear us confess it, but he's already covered that case. He's there pleading our case daily. Hey, the day that we're here, we're not here on Saturday. We're not here on Tuesday. Now, we may be back. We'll be back next Wednesday and all that. And I'm not knocking churches that have other days of worship and all that. The Bible says don't put your emphasis on the day. Hey, the emphasis ought to be on the Savior. But we are New Testament Christians. We do worship on Sunday on the first day. And it's a memorial of the day that he rose again. Acts 20, verse 7, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. In Revelation 1, 10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And then the church, the body of Christ, as the worldwide body of Christ, but in the local church, and you know the head here is? Jesus Christ. When we lose sight of that and we have any other head, whether it be a man, whether it be a group of men, whether it be anybody, we see them as the head, the true head of this church. Oh, there's an under-shepherd, but I'm going to tell you what, when the day we lose sight of the fact that Jesus Christ is our head and our purpose and our sole reason for being here, our sole reason to go out those doors and tell him, when we lose sight of all that, we might as well sell it, let them put an auction barn in here. Because we've gotten off course. But the church, the body of Christ, has Jesus as our head. That's all because of the resurrection. Ephesians 1.19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe, according to us, I like that, us word who believe, according to the workings of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And I've put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. I'm glad we as the church and we as this local church and those of you that are guests with us today that have other churches you attend I'm glad that we can all go into our individual church that we worship in and know no matter where you go in the world and a church that's a group of believing believers ecclesia called out assembly we know we can go in there and Jesus Christ be the head of that no matter where you be
And I understand that the resurrection is the one truth that separates the Christian faith from all religion. There's a, now this fellow, I, I, my, my name is Jim Lane. The reason I say that, most of y'all know that, is I got two one-syllable names. All through school, you know, if you got a kid that's got about two or three-syllable name, first name, last name, he gets TJ or something. You know, you just kind of cut it down and all that. But unfortunately, with the two-syllable whole complete name, not my middle name, uh, man, I just, everybody called me Jim Lane, Jim Lane. You know, I just always got kids called Jim Lane, particularly when I was in trouble. But this fella here, I'm going to tell you a little story about right quick. By way of illustration, this fella got a name, and I'm not sure in history which part of it he was called, but listen to this it's a good illustration. The originator of a new religion came to the great French diplomat, statesman, listen to this, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand Perigord. Boy, that's a name, isn't it? Let me just say that fella's name again. But his name's not what's important. It's the truth that he spoke. Charles Maurice de Telleyrand-Perigord. But this new, I'm going to call him a cult leader, but began a starter of this religion, came to this statesman of France and complained that he had a new religion, but he couldn't make any new converts. That nobody would join his club. Nobody would join up with him. He said, what do you suggest I do? He said, I should recommend that you get yourself crucified, then die, then be sure to rise again on the third day. Hmm. Well, isn't that something? fellow had a funny name, but he knew truth, didn't he? He knew there's something about that living Savior. The resurrection is a proof mark of Christianity. Without the resurrection, all we have would be dead, re, re, dead religion, just like the rest of it. But we don't. We, we have lively hope because we have a living Savior, don't we? Now, let's look in the book, and we've established the fact there that believing, and, and we talked about not seeing, but believing, and, and a I just want to help you in a practical sense, in a practical way this morning. I want to establish the truth here in John chapter 20, verse 30. And many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. There's believing in life tied together throughout the Bible. Romans 10 verse 8 says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That, that is the word of faith which we preach. Okay, verse 9, chapter, Romans 10, chapter 9, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, Oh, that he existed, that he was a good man, thou shalt be saved. Oh, no. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There's many today, maybe even some in this room say, oh, I believe Jesus came. But your hope is in that you've been a good person. You say, I believe he came and he lived on earth. He was a good man. He was a teacher. He was a prophet. He was. He was definitely a good man. Matter of fact, the only one. He was a prophet, of which all the prophets, the true prophets spoke of. He was truth. He was life. It was grace. Matter of fact, today I can take that further because in the Bible he, he was the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection. But there's a lot of people that believe good things about Jesus, believe that he existed, believe he came, believe that he died on the cross, might even believe he died for a sin. But have never trusted him as your Savior. 
never trusted and don't have a faith that believe. And a lot of people believe that he did. He, there's, a lot of, there's still a lot of people who don't believe he rose again. I mean, they may not deny that he existed, but they don't believe that he really rose again. And, and there's even, and there's, see, the devil's fought Jesus from day one. He's tried to wipe his name out, wipe his testimony out. And, and uh, you know, they've tried and they paid the soldiers off to, to say that somebody came and stole his body out of the, you know, they set a watch there by the tomb and then tried to pay the men off to say that he got snatched out of there and all. The devil's always been in that business. And if you're here today and do not know Jesus Christ, a free part of sin, the devil is in the business of trying to convince you that it's not real, that you're okay on your own, or maybe even that it is real, but you got plenty of time, don't worry about it. One day when things are right, then you can get right with Jesus. My friend, you are not promised tomorrow. Let's see two things this morning. This is going to take a little bit different turn from a resurrection message. But number one, we as God's children sometimes have doubt and disbelief. Is there anybody in here besides me? That, I'm not talking about doubt that he existed or, I mean, did he, or did he rose again. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about just have doubts in life and get uh, tore down and get kind of overwhelmed with what we're facing and uh, man, I, I don't know about you, but I do. But I'm quite sure if we're honest with ourselves, we'll all would it be, and I'm not asked for public confession on that, not need any need in that. I'm just trying to say we face things, we get in tough spots in our life. You may put a ribbon there or put something there to mark that. Uh, we may or may not come back to it. Uh, but go with me to Mark 16. Let's go to the Gospels. Mark 16. I want to read here. The Gospels are interesting. I, I don't have time to go into all the detail of it. And there, I mean, certainly not. It will be a series but each of the four writers served a different purpose in God's kingdom. Uh, and that you can see that in Ezekiel, the four-faced um, seraphim there with the face of a lion, the face of a man, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. But you can see the gospels represented there. And I'm, I'm not going into all that this morning, but, but ultimately Matthew was to the, I mean, you know, to the Jews mainly and from a Jewish standpoint in this uh, represented by the line of the tribe of Judah and, and the teachings on Christ from a Jewish standpoint that he was the Messiah that he came. In the book of John, uh, the eagle, the freedom, the deity of Christ, the, the deity that he was, that he is king of kings, Lord, Lord. He is God's precious son. He's God in the flesh. So when you understand those things and not even understand, you see that each of the gospels are written from a little bit different perspective. Sometimes they're, they'll leave out details of a particular story or the whole story that'll be magnified more in one of the gospels. And it's not that they're against each other. They're all for God's perfect pur purpose, and which is perfect. And they all fit and mold together perfectly. They're knitted together. And there's kind of, it's a fun story, study on any subject to compare the four Gospels and how they're presented there. But in this book of Mark, on, in chapter 16, I want to start at verse 1 and read it. That number one, we as God's children sometimes have doubt and unbelief. All right, I'm going to establish the, the, the death and burial here in the resurrection in the first few verses, 1 through 8, and then we'll go to verse 9 and start looking more deep. It says more deep, deeper, deeply, or something like that. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, still concerned for their Savior, still concerned, wanting to take care of even... The, the, the body that remained. So very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulchre at the rising of sun. And when they had amongst themselves, they shall, uh, who shall, I mean, wait a minute, let me say it. And they said amongst themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? 
And when they looked, they saw that the stones rolled away, for it was very great. Wind didn't blow it out of the way. Verse 5, and entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. You see, Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified, he is risen. He is not here. Boy, that's some great words right there, isn't it? Behold the place where they laid him. You don't see a body, you just see an empty rock there with an axe. Verse 7, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now I want to go back in verse 9. It kind of starts... A little changes gears a little bit, and look at some. This is God's choice servants. Now these, and I'm not gonna take time, and it would be a pretty long deal to go into each of these two or three verse passages. I'm gonna read to you and go back over into other gospels and see the see what it's talking about specifically. But don't you see some? Now, first of all, in verse nine, now when Jesus was risen the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that I uh, had been with him as they mourned and wept. But it, she heard the message and she quickly went and spread the message. He's alive. But think about that. It's Mary Magdalene. If you know the story, when Jesus, uh, I want to say, I almost said stumbled across him. But when she met him, this woman was in a fix. She was full of the devil, full of devils and demons. And she was in a mess. And by the way, I know of. Savior that specializes in that. And he cast those demons out. He saved her, changed her life. And man, throughout the Gospels and throughout the resurrection passage, boy, Mary Magdalene's a key, key character in our Word of God because, boy, when he saved her, when he cast those demons out, she didn't forget it. She didn't get all backslid and bitter about somebody said this at the house of God, quit on God and all that kind of stuff. Man, she was just there. She was there when she was going to anoint his body to take care of his body in the death process, the death, death and that process there, going to uh, put those uh, anointing oils and those things on him that they did in the custom of that time. But she's there. She believed him. And of course she believed. Just She remembered what Jesus did for her. And then look at verse 10 and 11. It says, and she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, what was those little two words right there? Believe not. Well, we're not sure about that. You sure that's telling the truth? They, now, it's not, now, don't take me wrong, I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about a belief unto salvation. We're talking about just to kind of think about it. Those 11... The apostles, the disciples had been with him for three years now, pretty much daily, most of them. I mean, some in pl some places, some in others, but, but man, they, they depended on that friendship. They depended on, and they understood who he was and what he was about and the, the message and kind of were grasping the kingdom of God that was at hand and they were getting hold of that and all. And, and now he's dead. See, it's easy for us. We look back, we've got the Bible written to, written that, that period and that time written before and we can look back and we know, we know he's alive. We know the rest of the story. They didn't. They're friends. Their leader, their savior was gone. They didn't understand the fullness of building a temple and tear it down in three days he'd build it back. He, they didn't understand all those things he'd spoken to them. But in verse 11 it says, uh, verse 10 it says, she went and told them that had been with him. I just want to focus on that little part right there. Those that had been with him. They knew him. But yet they were preached about despondency the other day. Probably were pretty low right now. And oh, I'm sure they were familiar with the law enough and the book of, books of Moses, what portion of scripture they had at the time. I'm sure they were familiar with that enough to know that I'll never leave you, never forsake you, be not dismayed. But he's, the last thing they saw was he was 
put in a tomb. He's not there. This is not, a, it's, understand, it's not people rejecting unbelief, that rejecting unbelief, but people that were in a crisis. Verse 12 and 13, it says, and after they appeared in, and after that he appeared, and that was Mary going to tell them, then tell them, tell those they didn't believe it, they didn't quite understand, they didn't get that he was rose again already, uh, verse, or at all. But verse 12 says, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. That's the road to Emmaus, as they went and he appeared to some of the others. And they went and told it into the resi- residue, just meaning the rest of them, the others that weren't with them, says, neither believed they them. Wow. In verse 14, and afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. And, at, and listen, now we know this is John chapter 20 and old Thomas and, and Thomas wasn't, uh, didn't believe it at first. And, and then when Jesus came back and you know he saw the hands and prints in his hands and the place in his side. And he said, my Lord, my God. And he believed when he saw but, but verse 14, that's God's choice servants that he sat, that he'd had meat with them and upbraided them, kind of scolded, kind of uh, reproof right, about, because of unbelief. And you know the discourse over in John chapter 20. It says the, the unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Everybody didn't believe the accounts that he was right. They had, all had to see and I'm just wanting to point through that. That's God's choice of servants. And those are embedded in the other Gospels, the more details of each of those stories in the times where uh, they were there. Now, they're worded a little different in the other Gospels because they're for another purpose. They're not contrary to that. They agree with it. But, but I believe today on this Resurrection Sunday, yeah, on Easter Sunday, I just want to point out the fact that, uh, that sometimes, man, things are tough in our life. Sometimes you face tough circumstances. And, man, just sometimes you wonder why is life not going the way that you thought it would go. And, and you face, and, man, you, the, you dip into the well and run your bucket down there and pull that well back up. And some of you, when I say a well and do this, some of you have no clue what I'm talking about. But some of you, how many of you have done this and have drank that cold water with all the bacteria and all that stuff? That stuff show is good, ain't it? But you pulled that water out of the well of life and just didn't get out of that bucket what you thought life would have and all that, my friends. He's not left us. He's not forsaken us. And it's perfectly normal that sometimes we wonder and we're not sure why. I'm not saying it's perfect normal or that it's okay that we doubt God. But sometimes in the flesh, we just get weary. I don't know about you, but I do sometimes. And man, there's this resurrection. We have a lively hope, church. Have lively hope. We serve a living Savior. And the rest of this, uh, I mean, from this point on today, we've got to remember and keep on remembering when we get feeling down and forget, forgotten and dismayed and all that's lively hope. It's not dead hope. He's alive. He, he's, boy, he's, he never leaves us, never forsake us. Just think, had he stayed in that grave, that promise to never leave you, never forsake you would not be valid. Think about that. And, well, let's, let's go on. Uh, we read verse 14. Read verse 15, 16. Let me read 14 with it, though, because put yourself there with them. It says, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, and they sat at meat, and upraised them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And listen to this. It changes gears. And he said unto them, Said, so, okay, you may have struggled with unbelief. You may not believe everything you've heard about me, but I'm alive. I'm here. And because I'm alive, we got a job to do, men. And in our context in here, ladies and gentlemen, we got a job to do. But it says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, if anybody thinks that you've got to be baptized to be saved, and that's your text verse, 
Well, I don't mean to break your heart, but he goes on. He don't say, and then believeth not and didn't get baptized. He just said, believeth not, because the belief is what saves, not the water baptism. In verse 17, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up servants, and they shall drink. Any, if they drink any deadly things, shall not hurt them. They still had apostolic powers for that season and for that time that you and I do not have. We don't need it. We've got the perfect word of God. Why should I perform some miracle up here today when I can just read you the book? But they had a job to do. And we have a job to do. Now go with me if you would back to Matthew chapter 28. And I want to show you something from another perspective. See how they responded in certain times and instances. It's brought out kind of in a negative sense in the book of Mark that we just read. But look in Matthew chapter 28, uh, in, in verse, read five, verse 5 through 8 with me. It, it says, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, fear not ye, for, ye uh, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Let me read that again. He is not here, for he is risen. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you in Galilee, there you shall see him, lo, I have told you. Look at verse 8, it says, and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great, oh, a while ago it talks about the trembling and all, but, but it didn't need to put this other word in here. It says, with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. So I want you to know there was excitement that he was alive, but there was a fear because they didn't see him, had not seen him. But as the evidence came forth, that joy was restored. He is the joy restorer. In verse 9, as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hell. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. They, they came and and uh, he, he announced his being there. That he was there before them. And when they saw him, man, they worshiped. They were praising him and worshiping him. We ought to worship our living Savior today, hadn't we? I, I know some of y'all are tired of hearing me say this. But oftentimes, too often, we come into church. We stand up, sing this song. We sit down because that's what we did last week. Now, we change that up sometimes. Give song leader credit. It's not about song leader. It's about our hearts. But because we did it last week, we stand up, we sit down, then we sing that one, then we may stand up on the third one, but we do that. We're thinking about our grocery list, our Facebook notifications, and 17 other things. But boy, we as children of God that have a lively hope in Jesus Christ, we come to the house of God. Wait a minute, look back at All our lives, we ought to worship Him. We ought to worship in the morning. We ought to worship at noontime. Afternoon and supper time, and that is an evening. Y'all know that. When we go to bed, we worship Him. We ought to worship Him all our lives. But boy, when we collectively come into the house of God, there ought to be a spirit of worship that's higher than any tradition or cares of this world. I'll we'll be excited to get here. Okay, I'll stop. Stop there before I get on the soapbox. And they worshiped. Now go down to verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. He told them, Go. They went. It says, And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Look at that. But some doubted. Well, I'm glad we'll get to heaven. Because I'm absolutely convinced in my heart there'll be not one shadow of doubt when we get yonder, when our faith becomes sight. But as long as it's faith, the old nature will always kick in and create a little doubt. Verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, woe. He didn't say lo, woe. I said the woe. That was my woe. Excuse me. I wanted to back up. I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you. <laughs> I don't know if y'all are on the same page with me or not. He says, but I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Till this old body can't breathe no more. Till this old thumper can't pump that blood no more. He's with us. And if you're his, faith comes sight. We'll see him. See those scars. Get to spend all eternity with him. In bliss beyond what I have vocabulary to even come close to explaining. This whole purpose of the Bible and our whole purpose as believers is that right there that we that we get saved because it's God's will that none perish but all come to repentance. So our purpose is that we get saved and be his children and represent him and then as his children, our purpose is the Great Commission to tell others. And because he's alive, we've got a message to tell. And because he's alive, they've got a message to hear. And because he's alive, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you're not born again, because he's alive, that Great Commission is for you today that you know and understand he died in my place, he died in your place, he died for our sin that separated us from God Almighty. The resurrection is not part of my theology. The resurrection is a person. His name is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the resurrection. If our song leader and pianist would come forth with a good invitational song, I want to keep it real simple this morning. I haven't done up to this point maybe, but at this point I want to focus on one thing. Let's consider sin. All are guilty. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, for all are sin, it comes short of the glory of God. So we're all guilty, we're all sinners. And can I tell you this morning, sin is destructive. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. It has a payday. It'll destroy you in this life. It'll wreck your bodies. It'll wreck your homes, your lives. It'll wreck you. It's destructive. But then there's a second death. And that's over in Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment. Where all those that knew not Jesus Christ will go before them, they'll bow. And every knee will, every knee will confess, he is Lord. Every atheist, on, atheist, every atheist on this planet will bow before him and say, you are Jesus Christ. And I believe they'll say it with a repentant heart, realizing the greatness he is. But it's too late. They've rejected him. He's not the Savior at that point. He's the judge. And he'll cast them into the, the eternal lake of fire where the Bible says the smoke rises forever. Will there be no choice or no chance of repenting, no option for it, no presence of the Holy Spirit, no presence of God, for they cast away in the place of outer darkness? My friends, if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's your future. That's not my opinion or my theology, that's the Bible. But the good thing, for the wage of sin is death, but it doesn't, I'm glad it doesn't stop there. We have a lively hope. We've got a living Savior today. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So our price was paid. Romans 5, 8. But God commended His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you can be saved today. I read these verses earlier. This is Resurrection Sunday. Oh, He's alive. There's tons of evidence of it written and recorded in the Word of God. 
Romans 10, 9 again, is that if thou shalt confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Boy, there's something about that resurrection that makes it all real, makes it all true and valid. It says, Thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. A few verses down in Romans 10, 13, it says, For whosoever, you know whosoever is? Jesus died for whosoever in John 3, 16. The whole world, whosoever believeth in him. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know him today? Because he lives, we have a lively hope, children of God. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're here today and don't know Christ, because he lives, if you'll repent, turn to him today. Ask him to forgive you, to cleanse you. He will save you today, right now. Brother, what song are we going to sing this morning? What invitation song? Amen, Paige. Do you know Jesus Christ, your Savior? Are you born again? And could you give me a Bible verse? Could you give me a Bible reason to back why you say you're going to heaven? Do you know Christ? shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God I come I come continue singing I just want to say this it says uh, I bid thee come I, I invite you to come do you know Christ is your Savior? Is the Holy Spirit of God working your heart right now and you realize you're lost on your way to hell, but you don't want to? You know you're a sinner and you're tired of it. I want you to know because we have a lively hope, a living Savior, you can be forgiven today, know that you have a home in heaven, have that lively hope and that joy in your heart today. Do you know Christ your Savior? Are you saved? If not, won't you come down this altar Let's take this Bible, show you how I can be saved today. Is there anybody here that doesn't know Christ? Maybe here today and you're saved, but you ain't where you ought to be. Maybe the place, but I'm talking more of the spiritual condition of your life right now. Good lesson on Sunday school and Sunday school on the prodigal son. Won't you come home today? Won't you get an old-fashioned altar and say, God, forgive me. I want to walk afresh and new with you today. Let's sing one more verse. Do you need to get saved? Do you need to get right with God? What do you need to do? Maybe you just need to praise Him for being so good to you. For that lively hope that we have. appreciate your attention this morning. I appreciate all our guests today. Uh, we hope you had a, uh, enjoyed your time here. And if you don't have a regular church home, we'd love for you to come back and visit with us again. And uh, just good to be here today. Y'all go enjoy your days, spend time with your families, and uh, may, maybe call a few folks, tell them you love them, and happy Resurrection Day and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to eat some food and fire the grill up, put some more food on there. But got all the, some of the children coming in this evening and all. But I appreciate each of you being here today. We're going to close in a good song. And as soon as we close, um, Brother Vern, when we get through singing this song, I'm going to ask you if you dismiss in prayer when we get through singing, okay? <laughs> appreciate you all being here today. Have a good day. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Praise God. He's a living hope that we have in our heart today.
go and enjoy your Resurrection Sunday and uh, with your family and like Brother Jim said, sharing it with others. 303, we will sing the first verse and chorus of Glory to His Name. 303. <coughs> cross where my Savior died, down where from cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to His name, glory to His name, glory to His name, there to my heart was the blood applied, Glory to His name. Dear Father, uh, today has been a, a good day. Resurrection Sunday. We, let us go from here and celebrate the Resurrection Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for being able to be here. Go with us as we go to our house. Right